how would you write a story back, you know, before you had Microsoft Word and you could cut and paste things, you know? Yeah. Like Morgan was saying that you don't see collage, you know, in the big art fairs, but you see collage in every other aspect of life. I mean, you cannot right. walk outside without seeing collage. Every advertisement, everything you read, every book, I mean, every magazine, every newspaper, it's all collage. It's Welcome to another episode of Lucky Time Explosion. Wow. <laughs> How's it going, dudes? All right. Good, yeah. good. We're joined today by Stephen Rubin. How's it going? Great, great. Yeah. Another fellow here. collage artist. Yes. Yes. The we paper unite. crew is here. Yeah. You guys yeah. are going to have a lot to talk about, I think. Yeah. How was your weekend? Oh, it was crazy. I just been uh, caught up on a lot of stuff at worm, at home, at worm. Caught up a lot of stuff at the worm. I'm so home. deaf. I thought you said Rome. <laughs> yeah, I was I'm like, in Rome. He's busy again, going to Rome. I was Rome on the weekend, just the weekends, and then he comes back to Brooklyn or or sorry, Manhattan. Yeah, I'm in. Ma I'm in here, in Manhattan. That's anyway, right. Stephen, hey. welcome. Thank All you right. so much for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, I'm excited to, for to hear you guys talk shop a little bit. Oh, why yes. Don't, why don't right. you tell me? Ooh. Yeah, collage power. Yes. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, your background? I know you're a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. Is that right? There you go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yep, you got that right. So um, I, I'm in my elevator pitch is that I'm a uh, collage artist, a uh, art educator, and a retired psychiatrist. I'm sort of on a uh, uh, sabbatical with no end, and uh, my work explores collage as a metaphor for memory and identity. Mm. And so I think of the idea that like we go through life collecting these parts and we put them together into a story, but you know, there are always parts that, you know, are missing from the story and that any one part can change the story. So I'm really interested in the idea of flexibility of meaning. I think that's a really sort of potent message about collage. Oh yeah. That's, that's really cool. That, it's interesting. The identity, you're right. Like the little pieces that make us up. It's very similar to collage, right? I mean, that's, <clears throat> I, I have the same vibe going into my work um a lot of it is i don't know I, some of it is nostalgia um but not all of it mm. and I, I i watched this uh show on picasso and uh he constantly changed from one style to another of course and uh Evolve. one thing that he did not like was nostalgia mm. and i was like i'm doomed <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just because Picasso doesn't like it doesn't like, mean I'm you're just not, be, you're not doomed. Morgan. Well, I felt that right. like my nostalgia, <laughs> you know, nostalgia is, is of a, of a moment in in history and time. So you know, you're kind of like making a time capsule, which is cool, but is nostalgia timeless? Right. That's Can it be timeless? Depending. Can nostalgia be timeless? I don't know. No, what do you think? Well, I, you know, I actually have an idea about nostalgia. So oh. you know, I thought about it. Um, is that nostalgia gets a bad rap. You know, people think that it's sort of superficial, but nostalgia is actually one of the few emotions that we can have about loss that's positive. In mm -hmm. other words, when we think about nostalgia, we think that time is gone, that time is over, but yet we're not like resentful about it. Nostalgia is not like, oh, that time is over. You know, I wish it's sort of like that was a good time, but I know that it's past. So I sort of believe that nostalgia is actually healing. Maybe that's going to be Thank sort of you. a sort I of like a that. theme that goes through today, but like the idea that like, that really we want to look at the past in a way that we accept that things are, that, you know, that they're over and that they're done, but we don't have to feel the pain of the loss. So I'm actually really pro nostalgia and I want to come out as that. And I'm glad that you are too. Well, yeah. totally. I mean, it, it, a lot of the imagery that I use that has to do with nostalgia remind me of a happier time. I can't lie, you know? Right. Um, and sometimes I, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the material that I use is, is going back to, you know, the 50s when I was not alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not and even I like a to try to keep eye. some of that beauty alive, too. I mean, you know, there, there's so many different avenues you can go with uh, collage, you know. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of, you know, rules that I stand behind. Like, I, I don't like to use newer publications. Uh, when I first started, I was very attracted to encyclopedias. Yeah, that was a, just a texture of the old paper, like the old print style. Uh, you know, there was just something very different and attractive to me. You see the half tone sometimes, or an off print, you know, in a page that, that got fucked up. And there's something very interesting uh, for me looking through those older publications that you don't really get with newer publications. Interesting. And soon there will be no publications. Yeah, we have to prepare for the day. So it's true. Yeah. 
Interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in that idea you're talking about in meaning, uh, in your personal, in the identity. You teach classes, right? You teach workshops? I do. I teach workshops. I, I started off teaching a class that was called Psychology of Collage, huh. which is based Ooh. on this notion of, you know, that, that actually collage is a way of thinking. In other words, I think about it, you know, when I describe the way that I think, some people say, oh, I don't think that way. But I sort of believe that I go through the world collecting parts of things, and I collect parts of things that are related to things that I already know. So like if I'm going through a magazine or a catalog, you know, I tend to pull things out that remind me of something that I already know. Right. That's, and that's actually a, sort of an idea of like constructive learning. In other words, we as a general rule, as we go through the world and we learn things, we tend to say like, I already know something that's related to that. So I pick up that part. It's about trying to pick up parts that are not related to things that you already know that actually unlocks sort of new understanding and new meaning. So I call that psychology of collage. And then that sort of led during the pandemic into this idea of collage as a memoir. Mm -hmm. I felt really, really compelled to do an online workshop. So I did a six week, I did it three times at the Art Students League of New York, where we would come together once a week and we use the idea of collage as memoir. And I think a lot of us as collage artists, we relate to the idea that collage is memoir. You know, there was, we're telling our story through these bits and pieces. And then now this, the, the course is called collage and the creative process. Mm -hmm. And it's about the idea that like, every time I hear of a definition of creativity, that I think to myself, I could replace the word collage. So basically, like people talk about the idea of like creativity is where is the intersection between seemingly unrelated parts. It's about combining things in new ways. I hear these definitions of creativity. I say, oh, that's collage. So I think collage is a wonderful way of just exploring and learning about the idea of creativity. And we have all these solutions around us. We just have to figure out a way of combining them in a way in which we can move forward. We don't have to invent everything new. We, we have a lot of things around us. So I feel that collage sort of highlights the idea that there are all these things in plain sight. And I think that you, you, you and I, like every time I see something that Morgan says, he's like, oh, wow, I have that idea too. It's, a, it's sort of like a kinship that we have in terms of ways of seeing the world. Oh, mm -hmm. definitely. I think that, and, and, and this is for sure, one kinship is ADHD. <laughs> and I, I talked about this earlier uh, in 2017, uh, the magazine Collage, K-O-L-A-J, which is probably... One of the more uh, followed. What a hip way of spelling collage. <laughs> it's cool. It's so uh, run cool. by a, a gentleman named Rick Cassini, and uh, he's doing a lot of amazing things for uh, the world of collage. He's yeah. really bringing it into the forefront and putting a lot of time into uh, putting a lot more respect into the medium. Got to put some um, respect. Put some respect course. on the name. I mean, you know, Wait. for years I've been going to art uh, fairs, you know, freeze, going down to Miami, and right. very rarely uh, do you see collage in anybody's booth. And I feel like that's kind of been changing. Of course, you could see a lot of that at the Outsider Art Fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, or but, the, uh, yeah, the Outsider Art Fair or, is the one. Or, uh, yeah, no, mostly there. Stephen, <laughs> but, I want to yeah. know how you got started with collage, and do you do other art form or other mediums? Like, how did this focus on it start? So I, I think, you know, that the, uh, the medium finds the artist. In other words, like, yeah. a lot of times it's like people just, they start to work in a particular medium, and then it just, like, they notice that they're working on it at like three in the morning every night for like a year. And then they think, well, like, why am I? So that's how it was with collage with me was that I actually, you know, I had experimented with, I've actually made art my entire life. You know, people ask me at this, you know. Did you study it in school? I, I, I. Like how to paint? Well, I did take art classes over the course of my life and I did take some art classes in college. Actually, my major in college was modern languages and linguistics and I did a lot of creative writing. Mm. I think the collage is actually related to writing in a lot of ways. It's literary in some ways because we're actually taking apart publications. You know, I think that it's related to book arts and it's and the way that I put my collages together is very much like the way that I would write a story where I would take the parts and then I would rearrange it. I think about how would you write a story back you know, before you had Microsoft Word and you could cut and paste things, you know, yeah. like Morgan was saying that you don't see collage, you know, in the big art fairs, but you see collage in every other aspect of life. I mean, you cannot right. walk outside without seeing collage, every advertisement, everything you read, every book. I mean, every magazine, every newspaper, it's all collage. It's collage has said major collage has made a huge impact just basically on the way that we learn, the way that we think, the way that we conceptualize. But again, maybe at the the high, high level. But when you look, you know, basically at the art movement. Why movements, do you think that is? Well, I think that, you know, not to get myself into too much hot water here, but I think, <laughs> I think painting Jeez. reigns supreme. You know, I think mm -hmm. that over, you know, there is a hierarchy. You know, people say to me when, when As I- As a collage artist, I, I feel the same way. I just naturally feel that way. And I'm intimidated by painting. Yeah. And, you know, 
one of the things about painting though is that painting is like a, it's about transformation but it's painting is about like going from liquid to solid right right and collage is going from solid to solid you know what i mean collage is going from something an object that already exists in the world you just sort of cut it up it's dry and i actually think that a lot of ways you know you talked about add with um you know collage but there's obviously a lot of ocd in it too right <laughs> yeah. right 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 yeah. you know but part of the thing is also like i don't like to get too messy you know so basically the fact that everything is dry until the very end until like mm. glue it down all these things matter that's why like you know like i think about the idea that your art is like a fingerprint in other words it's an it's like a manifestation of all the different about the way that you move your body like i don't like to sit in one position you know at any one time i like to bend down and pick up and right and i'm yeah, always like right. taking different things out dif different physical process it's interesting totally. because i've heard so much you know that um like from artists from painters from other visual artists that like they do this because it's a visual medium they have a hard time uh thinking in words, thinking in concepts, thinking in the kind of what you're talking about, about like putting things together from, I mean, it is like a language, right? Like a, it's a visual language, but it is, I see what you mean by it's literary. It's like you're, you have to compose a sentence yeah. in the same way with words that people understand mean things. So people understand that these images have meanings. And then it's a question of like, does, does your definition of it line up? And then, and then the other thing is that, like, you know, one of the things that you're talking about is that, um, you know, like, like, at the end of the day, like, you know, Morgan and I are going to take on the world with collage. We're going to show oh, yeah. basically right. how important it is. And we're on the that, crusade. <laughs> yes, the, paper the collage crusade. crusade. Yeah, the collage. Watch we're, out, but painters. Morgan's the exacto knife, and I'm a scissors, and there's the whole exacto knife scissors. You know, right, let's not get into that right, right now. Yeah, like, oh. then if we don't get into that, we better stay away from the digital versus analog. Oh, oh yeah, no. yeah, yeah. And then glue sealant. You know, let's 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 take it I'm easy. Not... <laughs> Wait, so your your team scissors, your team uh, exacto knives? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I couldn't help but poke the bear there. And you, yeah, you I must mean, have a very special pair of scissors oh i have to. a lot of scissors yeah do you do you have different scissors for different like specifically for different things i do i do uh -huh. i actually use like a eight inch scissors like one time i went to the airport and then basically like i thought that <laughs> got i got arrested and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're like this like they're hours. like excuse me sir there's something in your bag and they pull out like this literally this scissors like that could really yeah but but I, I, you know, my, my mom was in fashion business and, you know, I really learned about scissors because we used to go and we, I used to, I worked in the summer, we would roll the fabric out and then I would stand on one side and another person would stand on the other side and we would do the scissors across and then right, meet at the middle. Right, right. And then we would, so like I the, a lot of cutting. Like the, what's the dog movie? You know, like oh, kissing the spaghetti the lady, 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 lady in the tramp. Little spaghetti <laughs> move. Yeah. No, I have a friend who, like right after 9-11 was, a, he was trying to travel with like printmaking gear. Like, you know, those little chisels and stuff. He was interrogated for three and a half hours in the back. And I was like, you could just look this guy up. Like, he's obviously an art student. What are you doing for three hours in that back room? I don't know. They take you in the back room with those scissors? Well, or? you know, the funny thing is that what I've transported, I also feel like, you know, we talked about the ADD and OCD connection to uh, collage, but there's yeah. also the order and mule yes, you know what i mean yes, like yes. I, you know you you when you're a collage artist, you don't travel light you know what i mean like uh, <laughs> so i'm used to like i back in the day like in the i went to college in new york but i grew up in chicago and the things that i would bring on the plane like i would bring like turpentine on the plane right, i would bring right. like <laughs> huge planters on the plane you know what i mean like huge stuff like i can actually so anyway there's what's, you this, know, what's the weirdest thing you've ever brought on the plane besides your scissors the weirdest thing I ever brought on a plane was I brought these two terracotta planters, you know, these really long terracotta. You can imagine I put them like in, two carry duffel yeah, in two <laughs> duffel bags. They survived the trip. <laughs> yeah, they survived How the, the trip. Hell did they I, you need the to trip. transport some. Oh. Talk about an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> carry on, you know. Yeah, that was carry. You could bring things. You you could bring things. Well, you could actually you, back in the day you could actually bring a person with you right, right. to the gate, and they could yeah. be like, "Oh, have a great trip," you know. Now it's like, no, it's yeah, changed. No, it's changed quite a bit. I think the weirdest thing I brought on was uh, I was in a band, and I had a tiny little bass guitar that I was using to like it had to, it was quiet, like it wasn't going to bother anybody because the the strings were actually made of silicon, so it barely made a noise on its own unless you plugged it in. So I had like my little laptop set up flying to Hawaii and I was like practicing the entire <laughs> way uh, on my little bass guitar, like with the headphones and an iPad. Like, That's awesome. Yeah. And the, the ladies would come by, you know, the, the, the cabin assistants would come by and be like, what, what are you doing? You know, and they're like, oh, I'm playing guitar. Nothing will stop you. Yeah, exactly. Well, Nothing will stop me from practicing because I didn't need, I needed it. Oh, how about you, Maureen? What's the weirdest thing you ever brought on a plane? Uh, and I see your phone for the timer. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a good question. 
I don't know. I haven't really traveled that much, mm -hmm. um, which is sad. Yeah. Yeah. Where's the farthest you've ever gotten away from your birth, your place of birth here in, in New York? Jersey. Jersey. No, I'm sure. <laughs> I was trying to cover for you, bro. I was trying to cover for you. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Yeah. No, it was cool. I went around the whole island. You know, I got, I, I hit against fire coral. Ooh. Yeah, no, it was awesome. I got real sick. Yeah. And then I thought I should drink a bunch of whiskey. It would heal me, and it didn't. <laughs> oh no! What I a surprise! Do that today. What a shock! <laughs> Steve, where are you living? Uh, are you live in the city proper. You yeah, I live in. I well, I can see New Jersey if you I get to you. if I get to the river. But I, I live I, I live uh, in Midtown in Hell's Kitchen. I live oh, really nice. close to the Art Students nice. League. Actually, yeah, yeah. I love li living in Manhattan. It's my absolute favorite. I don't want to be anywhere else. Uh, I had a theory. I like realized why people hate Jersey so much because you know you hate things that you're afraid of and that you <laughs> fear, and Jersey has such punishing taxes for when you try to leave Jersey that it's like a black hole. It's like once you get there, you're it's really incentivized <laughs> to never leave. Well, back in the day as a marijuana smoker, you know, everyone knew that if you get caught in Jersey, you're fucked. Oh, yeah, back in the day. That was bad. Oh, <laughs> back back in, in the day, Morgan. <laughs> you said you weren't around in the 50s. Yeah, right. Oh, well, <clears throat> I age well. That's nostalgia for you. Yeah, there, there you go. That was there a bad go. experience, but a good feeling with it. Yeah, That's and funny. we were talking about Rockland County before. Um, and, uh, my dad used to work in Rockland and he used to drive from Monroe, New York, which Orange County to, uh, Orangeburg or Tapan. And that's another weird thing. It's called Tapan, New York. Yeah. But then there's Tappan Z Bridge spelled the same way. Tapan, Tappan. What the fuck? <laughs> Anyways. It's the Z part, I think, that does it. Yeah. True. This man used to drive a WR, a, a crazy fast Subaru, and smoke huge joints for 30 years driving up and down the Palisades Parkway. Mm. And if you know the Palisades, you can't really speed too much. There's no shoulders. It's, it's a beautiful trip on the Palisades. But um, somehow this guy fucking back and forth from Monroe to Orangeburg smoking tons of weed was never pulled over once mm. and so when i got in trouble it was a big deal like, how do you how do you I do never it? got caught once in my whole life <laughs> i'm like whatever dude <laughs> but uh yeah well, it's something about down. your identity something about yeah. who you are <laughs> yeah like, i want to bring that. it back to uh he must be jewish <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh so see i want to talk more about that um the concept of like uh, identity through collage and do you have any examples of like any of your classes with your kids where or adults or whoever you're, you're teaching you said mainly children or no, actually mostly adults, adults but i do i am Black doing like children <laughs> like hopefully us. hopefully like we us. i mean i do <laughs> no we as artists we often want to get to the child part yeah. right? in other words a lot of people say that you know like the child so i really value that I do too. I'm trying. I'm trying to grow up. To be honest, I'm like almost 40 years old, and I've I've done a really good job of keeping childlike my entire life. And now yes. I'm like, shit, I got to get this shit together. Well, uh, you we, you talk about that in terms of identities, right? Yeah. So basically, you know, like there's a lot of work. You know, we're not going to get too deep in the psychology stuff, but obviously, yeah. there's a lot of inner child work, right? About the idea that the inner child is like really right beneath the surface. So that's an right. example of basically how we can tap into these parts of ourselves almost as if they're layers of a collage, right? Yeah. And that there are parts that are very deep that actually show themselves at the surface as if they were basically the adult, the adult self, but they're the child self. But I'll give you another example of basically the idea of identity is that, you know, over the course of our lives, we take on different roles and we basically, the way we sort of describe ourselves changes over time. And basically back in the day, to use your yeah. <laughs> phrasing, I would have said that I was a psychiatrist and an artist. And mm -hmm. now I say I'm an artist and a psychiatrist. And I just rearranged the parts. The words, order. And, the, and it changes, right? And that's basically, that, that's really different to be an artist and a psychiatrist versus a psychiatrist and an artist. It's a tiny little tweak, but that's an example of how basically changing the parts of our identity and sort of what we prioritize, how we present to the world, you know, is this ever, I believe that it should change over time. Like I talk about this idea of like, don't get stuck in a story about yourself. Yeah. That's that's a tough one. I mean, I have like I've said a lot that I want to like just write a book so that I can hand it to strangers and be like, <laughs> here's all the stories I tell constantly over and over again and just never tell them again. Just be like, here's a book. Read that if you want to know about me. I'm going to never speak again because I'll do that a lot where I'll repeat the same thing over and over again. It's like a, a mythology that we like pound into our own heads. And, and then you, then one day your mom calls you up and goes, you know, that never happened, right? 
Like, <laughs> you, you're misremembering <laughs> something. I said that was your uncle. I'm like, oh, fuck, my entire worldview is <laughs> collapsing. Uh, but I want to know more about, like, kind of what you tell um, your students, like, uh, when they're, w when you get them to use collage to express themselves and kind of compile, I guess, a vision of themselves. Is that, is that the idea? You're like, go out there and find things that are meaningful to you? Like, what do you tell them to look for? Well, I have, a, sourcing? I have a process, which is basically, first of all, I like to facilitate people's own process. Mm. You know, I actually, I, I did a lot of teaching. I was at Columbia for 20 years. I did a lot of teaching of residents and uh, medical students. And I often just sort of like wanted to pay attention to what the knowledge base that they already had and basically just sort of like allow that to flourish. So I'm big in the idea like that. I don't have a preconceived That's notion. That's awesome of, because I feel like a lot of teachers probably just like try to like shove their own ideology down, <clears throat> you know, the ways they do things down people's throats. And that's cool that you're nurturing, you know, people's original vibes of why they became an, uh, an artist in the first place and to just take that to the next level. Yeah, and that basically, cool. and that like, I can't even stand from a position of saying like, I'm an authority on something and you need to do it this way. Because I don't know, like if I actually have humility about my own life, it's like, I, I guess I know some things, you know what I mean? Like I, I have some degrees and stuff and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, People are going to come up with their own solutions to their own problems. And what I would like to do is just facilitate that. So as an art teacher, that I take the same mentality. That's so awesome. if somebody's, but then again, I will say to somebody like, you know, uh, there's no focus there. You know what I mean? Basically, like, what are you, you know, maybe like, what are you trying to say? I tend to like keep it rooted, though, in the idea of like, basically, I do believe in the power of aesthetics. I do believe mm -hmm. in the idea of like the line, the depth, the, the perspective. The golden ratio, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Because I do feel that those, there's a re, there's actually like a psychological correlate to those aesthetic principles. In other words, yeah. that they're not just random. Yeah. There's a reason why we gravitate toward them. So why not, you know, you gotta be rooted in something, but I'm much more rooted in the idea of like helping them to express themselves through art and then to just basically tap into what they're already doing. But I do, for the sake of the acronyms, which I promised you I would give you. Oh one. yeah, yeah I'm so excited for these. Basically, ODRA <laughs> R. So ODRA R is observation, deconstruction, rehearsal, assembly, refinement. So it's like I, what I do with the class is basically let's observe first, really observe. I really people say I don't know what I'm going to make. I'm like, well, we're just at the observation phase, and then mm -hmm. I say let's start to deconstruct things. I do believe in Morgan and I were talking about this idea that actually picking things apart and dissecting them, you know. Are, is just like such an important part of the process. You cannot sidestep that. You must go through that. Yes. And then basically, then you start to rehearse, put them together in multiple different combinations. Then you assemble it, and then there's always a possibility to refine it. And that can happen like years later. So in my classes yeah. in general, we have a follow-up like a month later where the students basically talk about what's gone on and they present their work a month later because it always evolves. I, I can't ever get over the weird, like innate, built-in ideas people have about art and about how it works and they always think that like they need to be original when everything's been done before they they feel like things are cheating you know by tracing something copying something and like that's how this craft works right like you have to actually copy stuff deconstruct it understand it in order to do anything new but everyone's like right out of the gate just being like oh we got to do something brand new out of nowhere it's like that doesn't happen no. you know no I don't very think rarely happens. at least very rarely yeah that can't be like that can't be the, you know you really artists obviously they psych themselves out and you know we could make a whole career out of like helping artists to just yeah. you know like basically not psych themselves out or put too much in you know in terms of their work but somebody should do it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like we're like that's where we're gonna get the you know yeah. all the endorsements from but i have this idea which i call low stakes work which i basically make mm. a plug you know i said acronyms now it's like yeah. you know check 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 did i cover that did you cover that <laughs> so low stakes work for me low stakes work is like a way of getting over a hurdle and low stakes work is this idea that like no preconceived notion so if it's completely copying if it's completely tracing if it's it doesn't matter basically you have no emotional connection to the work it's just mm -hmm. a matter of basically the second is that it's that it's small a lot of artists say oh i need to work big it's like yeah there's an appreciation for something that's small like i've been making these like uh, my you know like i call them my wallpaper samples where i just basically just carry a stack of these you know like these little like you know informal painted paper collages and i just i'm like oh so it's small and then the third thing is cheap so like <laughs> you can't be attached to something that's small that's cheap that you don't expect to be good at and you don't have to show it to anybody and from that often basically yeah. from the ashes you know then mm. the great work can but you must have this practice in which basically you try to stay not emotionally connected and just curious but then 
Because once you once the materials are expensive, then you're already attached to it. Right. Yeah. What's your favorite go to source material? My favorite go to source. You know, the funny thing is that I am a dumpster diver. I will admit. Oh. You know what I mean. I stopped I hear doing you. it I during hear the bed bed bug crisis. That was like um talk about. I don't have nostalgia for the bed bug crisis. <laughs> I, I it was a morning because I used to get the most amazing things from the street, but now I live in this building where you know people get a lot of catalogs and magazines still so like i go to the to the uh recycling bin and i'm like basically anything that's in there i like the idea of like literally picking up scraps so my favorite go-to source is one that is literally like at the bottom of the recycling bin you know what i mean that i rescued from somewhere (laughs) and that it's something that like somebody just like threw out i'm like you threw this that's like sean ritz yeah yeah he would do that he would do that as well like go and go and pick up all the magazine subscriptions from people on his floor God, the bed bug crisis, though. I think, uh, when was that? I think I was in Brooklyn during that time. And I lived in a place that was completely constructed out of found wood oh, off no. the street. Like, you know, like a crazy tree house of it. Ooh. All these little nooks and crannies. And I was about to move in there. I had all my shit loaded on the back of this bus. And I get a call from them. And they say, like, hey, uh, we have bed bugs. And I'm like, I'm literally about to bring all my earthly possessions over there. So I had to like take them over there, put them all in big plastic bags and put them in the middle of the house and then go stay at my old house for two weeks while they treated. And uh, <laughs> can you imagine all of the pro- the polypropylene they had to like, what do you call this stuff? Uh, polyurethane. They had to put down on every piece of wood to treat everything. And it took weeks and it was terrible. And then when it was done, I actually had one bed bug that was like under the polyurethane oh. and like visible in my room, like sticking there. It's like a bed bug museum. So some people come yeah. by and be like, you know what a bed bug looks like? Like it's right here. This, this. If you see one of these moving, let me know. You know, that sounds like a great one for Art Basel. You just tape that yeah. bed bug, you know, because you want to get things that people relate to. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's the really, I feel that the real beauty in art is like, is to choose something that people can relate to and not highbrow necessarily. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. the bed bug museum, you know, maybe you could do these amber, you know, jewelry. I could totally piece, create bug, like little bed bug and sculptures. And you could use it as kind of a therapy for people that need, you know what I mean? Because the bed bug crisis, I mean, people lost a lot of stuff. It still blows that. my mind. Flea circuses. Oh, yeah. Like they have a bed bug circus. Flea circus. <laughs> it's crazy. They like, they actually said they created tiny circuses and these little fucking fleas were doing different shit like juggling and <laughs> i'm pretty sure that the flea circus worked like uh it was all they were like moving things they around. were moving things around with like springs and saying that they were fleas i don't think they were actually fleas juggling please don't burst my yeah body. i mean seriously you just yeah. talk about fucking someone's life <laughs> you just totally sank my battle shit. i'm sorry my I'm fleet sorry. my flea battle <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> I'm sorry to ruin your childhood about. I'm gonna have about to fleas. do some research on this. Yeah, I, I, I got a better. I, go I mean, back. if hey, if you find juggling fleas, I will eat my shorts and uh, you know apologize uh, profusely be, to you. Yeah, no, that'd be awesome too. No, that's funny though. Yeah, the the bed bug thing was crazy. Uh, I, actually, I know what you mean. I, I during that time, um, I thought I had bed bugs. I was living with my girlfriend at the time, but nothing was happening to her, mm. and I had like yeah. spots all over my body. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? It was actually due to generic Xanax, and it was the coloring. Oh. It was the coloring of the Xanax. Oh, wow. That that's I was allergic, allergic to. to. That's crazy. And it just so happened that I, the way it affected me made it look like I was covered in bug bites. How fucking random is that? That's weird. The, the generic coloring. You should like take that coloring and grind it into a pigment. I should. And like, use that yeah, to like, the wash Yeah, your... It's expensive now. <laughs> yeah, Xanax. right. That's right. <laughs> But yeah, I want to. Uh, so you, when you tell your students, like, I love that idea of low stakes art. Uh, I feel like a lot of what I do is like that, and I feel like that's what I, I like about the VR. It's like it's very low stakes. It's like it's digital. I'm just kind of goofing around in a video game. Uh, but then I can make these things as important as I want to. I can blow them up. I can print them archivally. I can like you know spend some time framing them. I can I can make them as permanent as I want to. How do you archive your work? Like, how do you make sure that it uh, stands the test of time? Well, I uh, have a whole procedure of sealing the work mm-hmm. where I seal it with like six layers of sealant. Mm-hmm. I make it Ooh. I make it actually laminated in a way where okay. basically it's like it's impervious to moisture. What do oh, you use? Awesome. So I use um, two layers of I use two layers of uh, acrylic medium. Then I use one layer of what's called isolation coat. 
then I used three layers of uh, golden waterborne varnish. Wow. That's so awesome. I really basically, when people look at the work, they're like, uh, you sealed this, right? I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, but they, well, yeah. Definitely. Um, tell people when your next thing is coming up and where they can follow you. So um, you can follow me at uh, stevenruden.com. Thanks. Uh, you can also check my Instagram at stevenrudenart. And, um, uh, you know, check out, uh, you know, sign up for my mailing list and I'll let you know about talks and workshops. And Absolutely other kinds of do that. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next time. Stick around for the full episode on Patreon.